We're missing a couple of speakers from the, from the program. Monique couldn't make it, and Stephanie couldn't make it, no relation. And, um, but you know what's missing? Everybody look at this rogues gallery that we have up here. Something is missing. A bully of a regulator. There's no, there's no gorilla of a regulator. Where's Will Travis? Where is he? Will you come on up? Take a, take a seat, please. I can be a bully, too. This will be point-counterpoint. It will be you against everybody else. All right, to kick off the America's Cup program, I thought I would do the absolutely logical. And I would go back to 140 years before Colonel Leedy graduated from West Point. It was commissioned a second lieutenant to the, to the year of 1847 in San Francisco. 1847 was important for only two reasons. One, San Francisco changed its name from Yerba Buena, am I right, Mark? to San Francisco, and they did a census, and they counted 447 people in San Francisco, and almost as many dogs. The dogs were counted in the census. <clears throat> Two years later, the gold rush began. And this is an early rendering of San Francisco in 1847. Ironically, this rendering is, was drawn by an artist from about the very location where my office is. This is California Street. This is Montgomery Street. And Commander, right here, this house here, you can barely make it out, was the house of the first captain of the port of San Francisco, William Liedestorf, a freed black slave from the West Indies, the houses of West Indies construction. This is the financial district of San Francisco. Vessels are just beginning to arrive for the gold rush. This was taken in 18, this was drawn in 1849. And boy, did the gold rush come in. From a population of fewer than 500 people, by the end of 1849, the population of San Francisco was about 50,000 people. And this is the oldest known photograph of San Francisco. It's in the Bancroft Library. It was taken in 1850. You can see that it is now a city. These are brick buildings that didn't exist the year before. Out in Yerba Buena Cove, that is a veritable forest of masts. Most of those ships were abandoned. So the gold rush happened, the silver boom happened, and <clears throat> then San Francisco settled back into a golden era. In 1893, the Columbia International Exposition was held in Chicago. Michael DeYoung, co-publisher of the San Francisco Chronicle, went back to take a look at it as San Francisco's representative. And he came back in July of 1893, keep these, keep these dates in mind, he came back to San Francisco in 1893 and he gathered the business and civic leaders together and he said, we're going to have a World's Fair and we're going to start it in January. How preposterous is that? But we did have that World's Fair. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the California Midwinter Exposition. It opened in January of 1894 in Golden Gate Park. This gives you an idea of some of the construction that was done. Michael O'Shaughnessy, a brilliant young Irish engineer with hardly any education at all, <clears throat> did all of the engineering work for this. A few years later, and by the way, that lasted for six months. It was the biggest thing on the West Coast. So with six months of planning, San Francisco put on a World's Fair in 1894. April 18th, 1906, a few minutes after 5 a.m., an enormous earthquake struck San Francisco and the surrounding areas and caused widespread destruction. Almost the entire city west to Van Ness Avenue was destroyed and south to Oakdale. This is an idea of the destruction. So San Francisco had to rebuild itself. And it again turned to Michael O'Shaughnessy to lead the engineering. The streetcar system was destroyed. The sewers were destroyed. Of course, the fire mains were destroyed in those tremors a few minutes after 5 a.m. on April 18th. Everything had to be rebuilt in San Francisco. But something else was being built at the same time, the Panama Canal. And there was an enormous competition in North America 
to hold another international exposition to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal. The competing cities were Los Angeles, San Diego, New Orleans, New York, and isn't this laughable, San Francisco. Why, San Francisco was in ruins. San Francisco was seriously bidding to hold the World's Fair to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal, yes. And in 1911, President William Howard Taft came to San Francisco and said, San Francisco, you win over all of those other cities. You will host the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915. And in October of 1911, this is a mere five and a half years after the earthquake and fire destroyed the city, he toasted San Francisco. I always thought Herb Cain made this up. He toasted San Francisco as the city that knows how. And did the city know how? Have you ever seen photographs of the Panama Pacific Exposition? Let's take a look at one. Here's a map from up on, on Presidio Heights. This is the Palace of Fine Arts to get you oriented. All of this, all of these facilities are in the Presidio. It extended all the way to Van Ness Avenue. Lombard, Van Ness, to the bay. A city had to be created out of the marshes of the bay. Michael O'Shaughnessy was again called in to bring utilities. The Palace of Fine Arts is the only structure still standing. There were 12 other equally magnificent palaces and a hotel that housed 2,000 people. And San Francisco put on that exposition. It lasted for a year. Next slide, please. Give you an idea, ground level, of what the Panama Pacific Exposition was like. Next, please. <clears throat> At night. Next. Then what happened? 1929, a depression. We think we're in an economic recession right now. Read the accounts of the crash of 1929 and the depression that followed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what did San Francisco and the Bay Area do during the years of the depression? Not much. Next slide. We built the Oakland-San Francisco Bay Bridge, which opened in 1936. Next slide, please. We built the Golden Gate Bridge, which opened in 1937, eighth wonder of the world. Next slide. Oh, we <clears throat> next slide. We built a little water project, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, again under the engineering supervision of Michael O'Shaughnessy, and more than 200 miles of aqueducts and pipes to bring the water to the Bay Area. Well, okay, so we built three little engineering projects during the Depression. They decided to have another party to celebrate. Still in the Depression, the Golden Gate International Exposition, Treasure Island, was created. This exposition lasted for a year and a half. And today, next slide, please. <clears throat> we have the 34th America's Cup coming here. And uh, that's 140 years, and that's more than 140 years. That's, that's a, a long time. We want to do this program in two parts. Uh, <clears throat> Basically, how did San Francisco win the bid? How did we get this phenomenal 34th America's Cup to come to San Francisco? And <clears throat> I'm going to turn to my good friend Mark Buell to, to talk about that in, a, in just a moment. And the second part of the discussion is essentially what lies ahead. What are the steps that lie ahead? Transportation, environmental review, permitting, coordination of navigation in the bay. We're going to have some big ocean yachts racing in the bay. At the same time, the Emma Maersk may want to come in at, what, 1,400 feet in length. Uh, <clears throat> what, what lies ahead for the 34th America's Cup? So let me briefly introduce our speakers. First, right behind me is Mark Buell, <clears throat> whom many of you know. Mark was... Uh, actually involved in the founding of the Bay Planning Coalition 31 years ago. Mark is president of the San Francisco Recreation and Park Department, as Herb Cain used to like to put it, the Rec Park Department, and uh, chairman of the San Francisco America's Cup Organizing Committee. 
Mark's had a distinguished career in both public and private service. His biography is, is in your pamphlet. Uh, I also want to call out the fact that he served with distinction in the United States Army in Vietnam uh, in the late 1960s and was twice decorated with the Bronze Star. He is, in addition, it's not in your biography, he's a writer, a poet, a man of letters, and a, a cherished friend of mine. And he is one of the very few people I know who hit a hole-in-one on a golf course while playing around a round of golf with the President of the United States. Um, <laughs> Uh, I thought I'd just introduce, <laughs> I'll introduce everyone else uh, all at the same time so I don't have to keep coming back up. Michael Martin is the project director uh, for the America's Cup. Uh, he's with the San Francisco Office of Economic and Work Workforce Development. Uh, before that, he was development project manager for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And Michael, it's great to have you with us today. Um, Gary Oates, another great friend of mine who's been involved with the Bay Planning Coalition for many years. Uh, he has got a wiring diagram of the environmental review and permitting process that is guaranteed to give you a headache. And <clears throat> Gary, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we have Colonel Thomas Stolreyer. Did I pronounce that correctly, sir? Commander. Not Colonel. Commander. I, it says Commander. I was armed. Okay. Uh, Commander, you're the successor, I think, to, uh, to that first captain of the Port of San Francisco in, in, in some respects. All right, but he never had an America's Cup that he had to deal with. Thank you very much for coming together with us today, Commander. And we have Scott Preston, who was introduced a little while ago with ACOM. And uh, Scott, there you are. <coughs> Thank you also for being with us. So to kick things off, uh, Mark Buell, how did this all happen? Oh, wait a minute. You know, the face is familiar. Um, <laughs> everybody knows Will Travis. I'm sorry, you're not listed. So you must not be there. But you've got to answer some questions. Thanks, Travis. What, a, what an introduction. John's a real poet. I, I write a little doggerel on occasion, so I, I admire what he does. I'm going to try and go through briefly uh, what we did uh, in, in winning the cup and a little bit about it, and then pass it on to the authorities. Uh, and I have a little bit of a slideshow here, so bear with me. I, I was involved in this organization. I was running the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency in 1982, I think, and we started talking about common interests around the Bay and that it might be a good idea to put those common interests together to advance the idea. So it's nice to be back. Let's see, is this going to, here we go. Wow, okay. That's actually, uh, I didn't realize this one was in here, but that's, that's two catamarans right along Chrissy Field. With the, that's kind of the idea of, of how close the, the race is going to happen to the people of San Francisco. So it's the 34th America's Cup in San Francisco. That's me, and I chair the America's Cup Organizing Committee, which is Let's see. Okay, it's going to show up in a minute. The America's Cup is the uh, oldest trophy in sports. Uh, it's arguably the toughest sporting trophy to win. There's only been four countries that have had it in 160 years. And uh, this time, the, they're designing the, the most exquisite what technology can do to go fast and to, uh, I think, entertain. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So last year, uh, Larry Ellison won on this behemoth, which was a trimaran, specifically designed for this one race. They've moved this boat to San Francisco, and I'm told it's going to be installed, or they're trying to install it near Pier 39, where the uh, America's Cup people want to run sailing academies and engage more kids into the sport. So it might be fun to see that. So the road to San Francisco, it, it, the cup was won uh, a year ago, and the mayor, uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom, immediately uh, stepped up to the plate because the winner of the cup gets to pick the venue and the boat. And uh, the venues that uh, Larry Ellison announced that he was considering were Spain and Italy and a number of American cities. And he went around to those American cities. Sometime during the summer, 
he announced that after seeing all those cities, and San Diego was included, and Newport, and others, he concluded that San Francisco would be the finalist in terms of an American city. So the committee was bolstered by that, and we figured we only had to compete with Spain and Italy, but we were told that the King of Spain and uh, Berlusconi in Italy had both offered Ellison a half a billion euros to bring the race to their ports. And I'll tell you a little story in a minute about why that became kind of a profound challenge to us. But so, uh -huh. that slide is signing the agreement. So I'll tell you the story. We were negotiating with these folks, and they were very tough negotiators. And on a Friday, I remember, in the morning, all of a sudden the negotiations took a whole different turn. And they were amicable and encouraging, and we were solving problems. And I was supposed to leave on a vacation to Hawaii that Sunday for a week, all expenses paid with my golfing buddies. And I realized that the, the and, and one of the fellows said, we're bringing our two top guns in from New Zealand. We're going to really solve this next week. So I had, I, I looked on my Blackberry and I said, and, and they said, and, and we think Monday night we'd like to have a big dinner to get all this crew together. And there were about 25 people in the room negotiating from the port and from the mayor's office and from the city attorney and from the Ellison uh, uh, Oracle Racing and, uh, and a, a group that he had created called the America's Cup Event Authority. So I texted my wife and I said, do you mind if we host a dinner for 30 people on Monday night and I'm not going to Hawaii? So that Monday night, the reason that we, I thought it was an opportunity was the mood had really changed. So I thought, all right, here's a chance. So I'm going to get every heavy hitter I can that has anything to say about this in the room at that dinner with these folks to convince them we really want it. So uh, I had uh, representatives, uh, Diane Feinstein came, a representative from Nancy Pelosi's office, a representative from the governor's office. I had the mayor of San Francisco, the president of the Board of Supervisors, one of the most progressive members, Ross Mercurimi, who grew up in Newport and knew the importance of the economics of the America's Cup. And uh, I had the president of the Port Authority and right down the line, everybody, and they all came to dinner and everybody was very enthused. And, uh, but Diane Feinstein got off the elevator at my place, and before she gave me the obligatory political kiss, she looked at me and she says, Mark, no federal money. Well, that, the state said the same thing, and of course the city was in the same box. Everybody was facing a deficit, and here we were up competing against this uh, uh, half a billion euro proposition. Now, why was it so important to San Francisco to win it? Economically, it's conservatively estimated to be worth a billion four hundred million to just the economy of San Francisco for the one cycle of racing, and you'll see some of these dates. It represents about 9,000 jobs, and as many as 2,000 people will move to San Francisco for a two-year period. Those are the crews and the family of the crews that will be racing during the summers of 2012 and 2013, and so we have an obligation to help them uh, uh, get into housing and schools and visas and driver's licenses and all those things. So that's the signing of the agreement that we did. But when we signed it, you may have read that there was a glitch in the process and they said they were heading to Rhode Island, that we almost had it and then lost it. What happened was we, uh, we arrived, uh, we concluded with their technicians supporting this that there were better peers than the primary peer they were looking at. And, and, and it meant a big saving to the city in being able to produce the structures for the city. And so we, the Board of Supervisors and the mayor, held firm with a, a more economical version of, of the uh, race, but one that was quite doable. So they took off to Rhode Island, and I thought, I always call it their vacation in Rhode Island, and they were feeding the press with all these stories that they're about to sign a deal and everything else. But two things happened. I went on site and I saw, and you all will appreciate this, that there was an endangered plant surrounding the port where they wanted to do it. It was called eelgrass. And then I went to the state environmental site and I saw what kind of rigmarole they'd have to go through to mediate that, or uh, to mitigate that. Then they said that they didn't have enough local money in this little town in Newport, Rhode Island. They were going to ask the federal government for $50 million. So I pick up the phone. I said, Diane, no federal money. <laughs> and on, on December 31st at 6 o'clock, they, they had to decide before the first of the year. December 31st at 6 p.m., they announced San Francisco had gotten the cup. So that's how we got there. Uh, what a journey. So what did we get? 
the deal we struck was that uh, not having the, the half billion euros to give them was that Larry Ellison would get certain rights to peers that he improved uh, in the terms of development rights. He wouldn't get permission to build. He'd have to go through, or his heirs or assignees to, to any development, he'd have to go through the normal process. But he had the development rights to certain peers. And the amount of money he put into to fixing the peers up for the race they would give him rent rebates uh, uh, in the deal. And so it was money in, money out. It was very transparent, and, uh, and, and, and so that was, a, that was a big incentive. Now, on the other side of the coin, the America's Cup Organizing Committee, which I think we have a list of somewhere, that was our celebration in City Hall after the December 31st. I think I missed one slide in here, but we'll go back. The America's Cup Organizing Committee committed to raise the $32 million it's estimated that it will cost the city to put the race on. And so I'm, I think I'm the only unpaid person on the staff, and I've got to raise $32 million. But that's going to happen. Uh, we're, we're negotiating on some sponsorship rights, and we're negotiating with the... Uh, uh, and I've already raised enough money to fund the staff uh, for a three-year period. So everybody's been forthcoming in terms of supporting it, which I've been very happy with. Uh, the new boats, they're going to have one year of racing on uh, what they call AC-45s, which are 45-foot long catamarans, and they're just coming off the assembly line in New Zealand right now. They're down there racing them. And then in summer of 2012 and 2013, they'll be on the big boats, the AC-72s, which are 72 feet long, 46 feet wide, with a 130-foot mast on them. They will go 1.2 1, 1 times the speed of wind going into wind and 1.6 times the speed of wind going downwind. That, if you have a 30 knot wind, you're moving going downwind. There'll be seven cameras on the boats. The, all of the crew will be miked, and uh, there'll be all kinds of visibility, and you'll hear more about that from other folks here. So between, that's really the um, kind of the setup. That, that's just a rendering of what the boats are going to look like. The big sail is a fixed sail like an airplane wing. It's not something you hoist up and down, and that comes into play when you're putting... Uh, the boats in the water and keeping them in the water for the races when you're mooring them uh, as a fixed wing. Well, that's the organization. I'm not even going to try and explain that, but there's so many different entities. There's the Ellison people. There's the America's Cup Organizing Committee. You'll hear from Mike Martin, who's, who's coordinating it all from the city standpoint. And then there's a race uh, management group, which is trying to keep independent because, believe it or not, every every time this is held there's some legal issue that somebody had an advantage or something so they're trying to set up an independent authority for that that's the course and you're going to hear more about that later but you you can recognize it god gave us the best arena to ever watch this the race in in all its history since 1851 has always been offshore this is the first time the race will be viewed from shore so the challenge and maybe Mike will address this, is if all the multiple jurisdictions, we have to have memorandums of understanding, keeping people out of where they shouldn't be rather than getting them to where they should be may be the bigger challenge, but there's, there's all kinds of, uh, of challenges, and part of that money we're raising will go for the uh, security and transportation and, and people moving, et cetera, et cetera. That's just another version of our stadium uh, enhanced. So in the summer of uh, 2011, there'll be these races with these AC-45s so that these teams will get some idea of how to race them, and they're already doing that. I saw a video this morning, and uh, one of them was uh, flipped over. When they're going that fast, they can... So all, everybody will be helmeted in this race. Uh, and incidentally, 14 teams have signed up. China has a team that they're putting in. South Korea has a team they're putting in. It's quite remarkable, and they expect after the vetting and looking for sponsors and all of that that they'll probably end up with about 10 teams. But even at that, 10 teams challenging in the summer of 2013 in the Louis Vuitton Challenger Series will be remarkable. Uh, in 2012, down below, you'll see they're going to do what they call a World Series event, but that's to give everybody experience on the bay, the currents and the crews and the boats, and that should draw some attention. And then the fall in September of 2013 will be the America's Cup match itself. That's the shipping channels, and I think there's other folks here who will be able to give you a better description of all of that. That's the village at Pier 2729, which will be kind of headquarters and, and, and the starting line and hospitality and press and 
retail and all the things that go with it, and the boats actually will end up whoops, somewhere else. So I'm going to try and show you this because this is the end of my, if this works. That ends my presentation. Thanks very much. I'm Scott Preston with AECOM. We were um, lucky enough to be included with uh, and working for the America's Cup. During the bid, we were the technicians that uh, Mark referred to that helped sort things out with the city. Uh, and we've uh, been retained again uh, during this next step phase of doing all the design work for uh, the America's Cup on behalf of the America's Cup. So what I thought I'd walk you through is uh, kind of what's next and uh, lay out the venues. Uh, I always start with this one again because we always have to, Ian Murray, who's head of race management, says, remember, this is a boat race in the water. And uh, it's something we need to focus on. Just informationally, that's not the course itself. It's just the blue line is kind of the area where the course will be. There will be multiple courses set up throughout uh, 2012 and 2013, but that's the sort of general vicinity. Um, again, 27-29. So a, a lot of these diagrams are from the notice of preparation the, that we worked with Gary on to put together. They're a good set of figures that kind of describe the venues uh, and the races. These are generally all the land side project areas because again, we start to get focused on the land, but always have to remember it's a, it's a, it's a race on the water. Um, so we're working on design efforts for all of the land side and water side um, parts of the America's Cup. These are all the sort of major venues. Uh, I have two plans here. One is the 2012 plan, the other is the 2013 plan. They'll look very similar. As Mark pointed out, the 2012 is about uh, 18 days all total with, I think, the Youth Cup is going to be in between, uh, last thing I heard. But the primary venues include um, uh, team bases at 3032, backup team support at 80, uh, and then um, uh, the primary uh, spectator venues, Marina Green will kind of act as um, the uh, America's Cup Village as 27-29 will still be under construction. Uh, and then other points would be uh, Chrissy Field, Fort Mason, Aquatic Park, and some other smaller events on some of the other um, national parks areas. 2013, uh, substantially larger venues uh, and substantially larger event, longer duration, as Mark pointed out, uh, larger amount of people coming. Uh, again, starting down south, uh, 80 is the... Um, is team support area, primary team bases, and the team bases are the boat garages. This is where the boats are brought in and out of the water. They're uh, maintained, cleaned, uh, sort of uh, kept up like uh, you might at a boat yard, but um, not to that level of, uh, of work. Um, with other adjacent areas, Piers 2628 for storage and um, uh, race ops, and then moving up uh, the pier, again, the sort of primary race village that was shown in the rendering, 27-29, primary spectator venues, press venues. Uh, it is uh, primarily a free event, and uh, Mark sort of gave an indication of the numbers. We suspect uh, we've been doing some number crunching, and I think uh, we're looking at plus 300,000 on what we'll call a peak day not sort of an average day, things like the weather and the teams and final match and all those sorts of things would go into a peak, uh, much lower numbers, obviously during an average race day. 
Uh, other major events, uh, s uh, spaces, as we discussed in 2012, would be up at um, the Northern Sites, Marina Green, Aquatic Park, uh, Chrissy Field, Fort Mason, then Cavallo, and um, also some smaller venue areas at Alcatraz, similar to what happens now. Um, a little more detail, and I'll just run through these. As I said, team bases and support operations happening down on Pier 80. Um, this, again, is 3032, um, primary location for the team bases, uh, moorings of the, uh, of the, the AC-72s, AC-45s in the water, uh, in and out of the water, depending on what work's going on with, again, other support areas adjacent. 2729, the primary uh, village, as it's called, for 2013. Um, event management happening, uh, race management, uh, and as well as the media center to support sort of the primary large venues. Um, large spectator boats plan to be around 2729. Uh, the current anticipation now is that the cruise terminal would be built, the corn shell completed phase one. Uh, by the port that uh, would be occupied for hospitality by the America's Cup for the event. And then, as I pointed out earlier, sort of what we call the northern sites, primarily large events uh, that happen not too dissimilar to what you'd see for Fleet Week at Marina Green or fireworks that you'd see uh, at Chrissy Field or any of the other sort of major venues treated as event uh, again, large and primarily a free event at uh, all of these locations. As Mark pointed out, it, it really is about bringing a new audience to this sport that hasn't really had an opportunity earlier. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Scott. Uh, <clears throat> next, let's hear from Mike Martin. And Mike, how are we going to get people to and from a place where they can view it. Thanks. Uh, again, my name's Mike Martin. I am the uh, America's Cup Project Director in the city's Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Um, that mouthful of a title uh, uh, really boils down to uh, me and my colleagues in my office are really charged with coordinating across the really remarkable range of planning and implementation processes that are moving forward, a number of which we're going to hear about today. Um, but a number of which are also sort of underrepresented today. Uh, I think Mark alluded to uh, working with, for example, the, the National Park Service, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area to make sure we safeguard these really uh, precious natural resources of these parks that also present a really unique and spectacular location to watch this uh, rebirth of the America's Cup. Um, uh, and I think uh, similarly to that, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about uh, what we've called uh, in San Francisco the, the People Plan. Um, which is, uh, oh, did I hit the wrong one? There we go. There we go. Um, so uh, on the end of March, uh, the city issued what is a draft uh, people plan, which is a transportation strategy to get uh, these tens or hundreds of thousands of people uh, down to the waterfront areas at which they'd like to watch the events from. Uh, we issued it uh, on our website, uh, as well as on the AmericasCup.com website, to really try to encourage people to give us their feedback. Um, I think that's a theme that, that we've uh, really seen throughout all of the planning processes here, is with the compressed amount of time we have to bring this really special event forward, I think we need the assistance of everyone uh, out there to give us their good ideas, their constructive or even unconstructive feedback, to really uh, understand how we can refine these plans to succeed in in creating the kind of event that people envisioned when they first uh, sought after it. Uh, and so um, I think the people plan represents a really good step forward in that regard. We heard in a lot of the, the uh, CEQA scoping sessions the comments of, from people wondering, well, how are we going to move these people around and will the rest of the city stop? And so we really set out as our objectives in this transportation strategy to really focus on how do we efficiently move people, how do we do this in a way that sort of supports the overall um, objectives of the event, which include sustainability and environmental responsibility, and how we do that in a way that doesn't um, bring the rest of San Francisco to a screeching halt, but instead enhances the experience of the residents and even the people that are here that don't necessarily want to view the events, but 
can really see a, a city that does pull together and, and put on a successful one-of-a-kind event. Um, the People Plan uh, uh, really seeks to look at alternatives to auto transportation for a, a number of fairly obvious reasons, some of which being the constricted areas around the waterfront aren't really conducive to a lot of people trying to get there in their automobiles. And obviously, again, coming back to the environmental sustainability piece, you know, we want to show uh, the San Francisco, the city, and the Bay Area in general as a place where, um, where, where other modes of travel, including transit, including bicycles, can really work and, and create a, a really uh, unique event. Um, so the slide up here is, is the transportation. Uh, it's a depiction of the transportation strategies that we, uh, excuse me, the transit strategies in the people plan. Um, I'm not going to run through all of them, uh, but basically it's been an interesting uh, process where we've got the people plan out and we've sort of uh, moved into a, a lot of neighborhood meetings, community meetings, gotten feedback on our website um, to really, I think, people are seeing this not only as an opportunity to create a, an event that really works, but also a legacy for the city. And, uh, and I think that legacy hopefully will, will come not only in, in sort of uh, bricks and mortar or actual transit lines, um, um, but one of those being the, the E-line along the Embarcadero. I think we've heard uh, really, really strong support for making this a, a permanent service that would allow a connection from the Fisherman's Wharf area up here all the way down to Caltrain and all of the sort of event locations in between, such as the team bases here and then the America's Cup uh, Village for the 2013 events here, and along with all of the existing attractions that we already have, such as the ferry building and uh, down here at the ballpark, you know, really unifying the Embarcadero and, and sort of uh, uh, giving it a rebirth, not that it needs one, it being one of the most beautiful parts of the city. Um, but in terms of legacy, I think we're also looking at ways to uh, expand the idea of legacy to uh, sort of operations and uh, collaboration. I think uh, the people plan in its initial draft was really San Francisco focused. And in the time since then, we've tried to enlarge that circle um, to really talk to the regional transportation agencies to figure out how we can coordinate, how we can harmonize our operat operating standards, and how we can really leverage each other to create what one seamless approach to, to moving people around. Uh, Steve Hemminger from uh, uh, MTC uh, spoke at our, we had a media event, Unleashing the People Plan, and he had a great line about, uh, about the Bay Area being a transit first area, and not just transit first region, and not just San Francisco being a transit first city. And I think that's something we've all taken to heart ever since then. Um, uh, also on the, on the transit approach, I think we're trying to be strategic, uh, realizing that we don't have unlimited assets, and trying to figure out uh, with the help of uh, the consultants on the AR team that are also trying to scope out what are what can we project as some of the attendance on the big days versus the non-peak days and how we can really bring our assets forward in a way that really moves people around uh, in a thoughtful manner. Um, so um, that's one aspect. I think another aspect we're really excited about that I'll touch on briefly is uh, bicycling. Uh, the, uh, the location of these waterfront areas uh, has a unique attribute in San Francisco. They're pretty flat. So hopefully for those that are able, we can get them uh, the opportunity to use their bicycles to get around from uh, the waterfront locations along the Embarcadero to the viewing locations along the northern waterfront in a way that um, uh, sort of preserves capacity and avoids congestion for other modes of travel. Um, and I think we're not only looking at sort of creating uh, sort of secure bike valet stations where the red blocks are so that people know that if they ride their bike up there, they'll have somewhere secure to put their bike, but also looking at ways to integrate uh, bike rentals and bike share strategies for people, visitors from out of town that are coming in who um, would be interested in bicycling and seeing the beauty of San Francisco amidst their travel, um, but wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity if we weren't able to address that with some real concrete strategies. Um, I think the, the one underpinning through all of this people plan and, and sort of all, all of our strategies really has to do with trying to inform the public about what's going to be happening and how they can uh, sort of tailor their either participation in the events or, uh, frankly, the, the, the rest of their lives around the events in a way that's productive. Um, for transportation, I think we want to get information out there before they come out here so that they don't immediately think to get from the airport to the events they have to rent a car, but they're aware of these other opportunities. And I think similarly, we're very excited about looking at sort of real-time internet-based uh, information tools that will allow people to, to go on their smartphones, to go on their computers, and really understand, well, where is it I want to watch the events from today? Is that location crowded? How can I best get there? Um, again, that could be a legacy opportunity to really tie, tie together these, these data sources in a way that really improves uh, people's ability to get around the Bay Area in the future. 
Um, so uh, that's sort of the, the people plan in a nutshell. I think uh, we're definitely working to uh, integrate this thinking with the environmental review and, and the on-water planning that we've heard about already. Uh, I'll throw this slide up as a, as a quick pitch. Um, our, we're posting our documents at oewd.org. Uh, the americascup.com website is, uh, has a slash San Francisco page that we'll use as a way to not only inform the Bay Area, but people that are coming to the America's Cup website to get excited about the events. Hopefully they'll also learn about what we're building for them here as an inviting way to come and, and really share in this great experience. And then uh, at the top of the page, America's Cup at sfgov.org, we really welcome any thoughts, any, uh, any predictions of trouble, anything you can see coming forward that we should know about because we want to really want to get on top of this as soon as we can. Um, so with that, thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. I have one point of curiosity. Are the antique streetcars going to run on the E-Line? We're trying to make it so as many of them can as we can. Okay. All right. I'll bring my oil can and wrench to <laughs> tighten up those nuts. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Gary Oates, who's been with ESA for 30 years. I, I thought you were always the president, but you've only been the president for 28 or so of those, those years. Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. All right. And our Pro, uh, the title of our program today is, um, not this program, not this panel, but the whole program is The Economy in 3D. Somebody told me that the, your flow chart for the permitting and environmental review process had to be done in 3D because it couldn't be done on a flat piece of paper. Is that true? Uh, not, not exactly. No? Okay. Thanks, John, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, actually, I do have, in a, in a few minutes, I'll put up a, a, actually a fairly simple and generalized flow chart. The, the more complicated um, flow chart would be more suitable as a piece of art, I think, kind of uh, a la Jackson Pollock. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here this afternoon and uh, talk a little bit about uh, another sort of race going on, uh, which is to uh, to do the environmental analysis and get all the permitting in shape uh, to enable these uh, races to happen. Um, and ESA has been honored and, um, and not a little bit challenged uh, by, uh, by being asked by the city and the port to assist in the, in the effort to do the uh, CEQA, NEPA, and provide the support for all of the, all of the permitting that needs to be done in a, in a very uh, rapid amount of time. And <clears throat> to talk a little bit about uh, the, the environmental process, we are, of course, addressing the whole of the action, and there are many components to be considered for the America's Cup project. There are the landside facilities that uh, Scott Preston just walked you through, uh, various, um, various locations to, to uh, house the boats, uh, that would be in, involved up to up to 15 teams. Um, those, that, uh, as Mark said, not likely to, at, at the end of the day, be quite that many, but still a, a robust number of teams. Um, a number of spectator boats, uh, many of, of um, very large size, that tend to um, be present at America's Cup uh, events, uh, need to be accommodated. I think we're we're uh, anticipating as many as uh, 60 very large uh, spectator uh, vessels that would be in the bay during the races have to be uh, accounted for in the planning. There has to be places for them uh, to moor and, and to dock. Um, so looking at all of, the, uh, all of those uh, event facilities, then there are spectator venues, uh, and, and uh, not all on uh, city of San Francisco uh, lands, I would add. There, there are a number of um, spectator uh, venues envisioned in various places around the Bay, and of course that was the whole idea of, of looking at uh, San Francisco Bay as a venue for the America's Cup. Historically, the, race, the races themselves have been held 20 miles or more offshore in the various uh, venues where they've been. This will be the first time that the race will be held in a venue such as San Francisco, where there will be a really a natural uh, amphitheater for, uh, for folks being able to, to uh, witness the race. And of course, the environmental analysis needs to anticipate what that might look like and what the implications of that might be on, 
on marine life, on uh, other navigation activities in the bay, and, and, and account, for, uh, account for all of those things. Um, <clears throat> the GGNRA uh, will have an important role um, in, this, in this endeavor because some of the best spectator locations will be on GGNRA lands, um, primarily um, and, and particularly at Chrissy Field, which is a major uh, programmed venue. There will be smaller venues, uh, uh, hospitality, um, uh, corporate function kind of venues. And then we also need to anticipate in the environmental analysis what we're calling unprogrammed uh, spectator venues. Uh, while the effort will be made to provide uh, entertainment and, and attractions and services to draw spectators to designated locations, we of course know that, that there will be a, a certain number of spectators that will find their way in, in other, other places um, in, in places where there could be sensitive habitats or other resources nearby that will need to be protected and accounted for. So we'll be looking um, at, at, at all of that in the environmental analysis. Um, in terms of um, other, other aspects of the project, there is some uh, a limited amount of dredging. Uh, the construction, um, I would add, is um, virtually all of the facilities for the America's Cup, or, or most of them, will be temporary facilities. Um, they, will be, they will be put in, and then they will be taken out after the America's Cup event is over. So we'll be needing to look at both the um, impacts of, of that construction and the deconstruction. Um, intertwined with the America's Cup project is a proposed new international cruise terminal for San Francisco. That is proposed, uh, there, there has been uh, the last several years uh, a whole planning and design um, uh, effort that has arrived at, um, at, at the proposal to construct a new cruise terminal on Pier 27, which is um, going to serve as the America's Cup village in, in the 2013 event. So those two projects have, have now intertwined, so the, the idea being that the cruise terminal would be would be constructed to a to a, a certain level in an initial phase, used as part of the America's Cup uh, facilities and village, and then be completed uh, post America's Cup. So, so the environmental analysis is uh, is looking at that as well. Um, there's a number of of, uh, of players involved, and, and I'm not just talking about on the city side, but a number of uh, federal agency uh, partners. Um, in, in this endeavor, the uh, Coast Guard, uh, GGNRA that I mentioned, Corps of Engineers, uh, FAA, and of course all the federal resource agencies uh, very much involved in this process. And um, now I see that uh, my, my uh, simplified uh, slide is up. Just talk about what we're really trying to accomplish here in, in uh, carrying out this analysis. Um, project development essentially began, uh, really began before uh, San Francisco won the bid, but then accelerated, of course, after the announcement of uh, San Francisco's official selection. So that process has been ongoing, and I would say that will continue to be ongoing and, and refined uh, into, the, uh, into the, the early part of next year. The CEQA process is underway. We've issued a notice of preparation. The EIR analysis is... Uh, is uh, moving, moving very aggressively forward with a lot of interaction with the project development team. It's really the only way it could happen. A lot of back and forth and, and a lot of refinement. And I would say a lot of refinement in a, in a very good direction, which is, in my mind, what is supposed to happen with this process. That in response to some sensitivities and, uh, and information, the, uh, the project continues to be refined uh, to, uh, to reduce the potential for, uh, for any environmental, significant environmental impact. We're on a track that would have us completing the sequel process by the end of the year. We're currently targeting uh, releasing a draft EIR in, I'll say, the first part of the summer of this year. That EIR um, is being developed with the full recognition that it will inform uh, the NEPA process, which will run separate but parallel to the CEQA process here, and um, <clears throat> and you know, have to have to consider some some uh, issues and analyses that aren't typically part of a of a CEQA analysis. 
Um, that, uh, that process uh, shows uh, going into, into 2010, 2012, the, uh, the dash line is really reflective of the fact that the, the scope of that NEPA analysis is still being refined as we speak. The permitting process uh, began uh, shortly uh, after the CEQA process uh, was initiated and uh, we're, we're on a track to, uh, to gain uh, permits for all of the in-water uh, project components by the end of this year with follow-on uh, permitting um, extending probably for some of the land side uh, spectator uh, related uh, locations uh, into, into 2012. Uh, construction would then start early in 2012 um, and would continue um, continue off and on. Of course, we have the the events, the initial event in 2012, which will be a smaller um, smaller in terms of the time frame number of races to be held, the World Series, which is really has no bearing on the, as I understand it, the races in 2013, other than. It's an opportunity for the sailors to, uh, to practice, if you will, on the, um, with, within the race area um, and get familiar with, uh, with the waters and local conditions. So those would take place uh, in the summer of 2012. And in that in summer of 2012, as Scott mentioned, the America's Cup Village is, is proposed to be at the Marina Green because there will still be preparations and construction to be done to host the, the, the 2013 version, the, the, the full version, if you will, of the America's Cup Village. So, um, so anyhow, that's a, that's, a, that's a little bit of a snapshot of uh, what we're trying to, trying to tackle, and, and I guess, how are we doing it? Well, we're, we've pulled together a very large and diverse team that includes a number of city and port staff who are actively engaged in the environmental analysis effort. Uh, the city has put a, a, a lot of its resources um, into, into making this happen and, and shifted staff from other departments to uh, assign them exclusively to the America's Cup endeavor. So that's, uh, that's one way, um, um, obvious, um, uh, close coordination with uh, the array of regulatory agencies and other players. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier, the, the, the port and the city have stepped up to recognize the kind of staff resource constraints that many of the regulatory agencies um, are operating under and, uh, and helping fund uh, positions to uh, enable um, a priority to be put on, on the permitting for the America's Cup project. So, and in addition to that, uh, just a, a lot of very long uh, work days and weekends, uh, which is, uh, you know, creative ideas are, uh, are, are good up to a point, but it just takes a lot of, uh, it just takes a lot of manpower, and especially for a, a project like this, which is being refined on an almost daily basis, uh, to sort of keep, keep a pace of those, of those changes and <clears throat> make sure that they've been fully accounted for and analyzed in the environmental documents. So finally, I'd just like to make a point that um, this is obviously a tremendous opportunity for the region, and it's also a tremendous challenge to the region. I think it's fair to say that there are some cynics out there who would say that there is no way that the San Francisco region could ever get its act together to get through an environmental permitting and all of the other pieces necessary to get, uh, to get, to get it in place to enable this uh, event to happen. I, I would say that we have to prove them wrong. We will prove them wrong. Um, and I, I couldn't help but notice when um, about a week after the announcement was made that San Francisco was the selected venue that the governor of Rhode Island called a press conference and he had representatives of the America's Cup event there. And he did say that, uh, well, uh, fellow citizens of Rhode Island, it's not all bad. They were hope, they're hoping to get uh, one of the preliminary races going on this year. And in the, he used these words, in the small chance that the San Francisco venue falls through, we'll be ready to host 2013, in 2013 if that happens. So I think we need to take that as a, as a challenge and make sure that that, make absolutely sure that that does not happen. Thank you.
Thanks, Gary. Yeah, let's make that small chance fat chance. Uh, <clears throat> Commander Stillreyer uh, directs search and rescue, maritime security, law enforcement, and marine environmental response operations for one of the largest and most complex Coast Guard regions in the United States. Now, a few years ago, <clears throat> Richard, Jim, you may remember when the entrance channel silted in, about 10 years ago, the entrance channel silted in, the bar pilots were saying, we're not, we're not going to bring ships in. It was a real crisis. Maersk said, we're going to be out of here unless this problem is fixed quickly. Well, working with the San Francisco district, a couple of phone calls, a heck of a lot of luck. You may remember we got the problem solved. And the Maersk fella said to me, well, let's go out and have a nice lunch. And I said, you know, what I'd rather do is have a ride in on one of your ships to get an idea. It, it was suggested at one point that the, the bar pilot should simply see and avoid the high spots. You know, instead of 42, it was 41, 41, 41, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 39, 39. You know, just steer around. And I had never been on one of these vessels, so I was taking one of the bar pilots, uh, Kip Carlson, and I, we went out, <clears throat> and it was the Dirch Marisk, which is a little one, about 900 feet long. And I nearly had a heart attack climbing up the, the Jacob's Ladder. Once on the bridge, I thought to myself, you can't see anything for three or four miles. So, sir, my question to you is, how does that bar pilot uh, bring that ship in in the midst of this America's Cup competition? Simple question. I, I'm sure it's a... <laughs> I think I might be burned now. <laughs> Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Stuhlreier. I'm the Chief of Response at Coast Guard Sector of San Francisco. And uh, uh, as... Uh, an augmentation to my uh, not uh, inconsiderable normal duties, I'm also helping spearhead our Coast Guard efforts with regard to the America's Cup and preparing for the America's Cup. We said uh, what's ahead, and I think what's ahead is a very exciting and challenging event for the maritime uh, community here in San Francisco Bay Area. And it's already been said before, but all the things that make America's Cup uh, in 2013 exciting, uh, an inshore race area, lots of spectators ashore and afloat. Uh, and the fact that it's in the midst of, depending on how you look at it, the fourth or fifth largest uh, port complex in the United States, boy, that's the essence of the challenge that's ahead of us. Now, you've seen some prettier graphics of what the uh, arena for the uh, cup is going to look like, but as a Coast Guards, and we have to bring a little chartlet along and put it on the nautical chart there. Uh, as you can see, in red, we've highlighted the uh, north uh, entrance channel and then the, the north and south channel there. Uh, boy, oh boy, to have a race in the middle of that fourth or fifth largest port complex uh, in the United States is, uh, is really something. And I don't have to tell all of you that the port, that uh, the complex that's represented by Oakland and Richmond and Redwood City, Stockton, Benicia, Sacramento, et cetera, it's an economic driver, not just for Northern California, but for the Western United States, all of the United States. So it, it is indeed a, a challenge. What we did was we took a quick look. If we can get, is that not work? There we go. Uh, in the little uh, black picture, there is a. Uh, a screenshot from our vessel traffic service. And uh, for those of you who don't know, our vessel traffic service is kind of analogous to air traffic control at a major airport. And uh, what we did was we have a representation of what the actual race course or one of the race courses might look like in that yellow uh, box there. And if you take a look, we're talking about uh, a considerable amount of activity during the uh, a typical day, uh, 10 tug and barge transits, uh, 20. Uh, deep draft ship transits, 35 ferry transits, uh, and then on top of that you have the, uh, the tour, uh, tour boats and ferries going out to Alcatraz and along the waterfront. So we do have quite a bit to, uh, to, to coordinate. Uh, we're working very closely with America's Cup, and we want you to know that our top priorities are safety, security, and a successful event. Don't think of the Coast Guard as an advocate for America's Cup 34 as much as a facilitator. We're very excited about it being here, but we owe an allegiance and, and a, uh, a kind of a trust to all the users of the waterway here in San Francisco Bay. 
this is an important event, though, and we want to work with everybody to do our best to ensure that, that there is as little disruption as possible to all the normal maritime activity. We don't have any intention of closing the port. So to talk about the challenge of how do we get these vessels through, uh, we have set up a maritime task force with a lot of the maritime industry uh, representatives in the area. They've met twice, and we're going to continue to meet over the summer. Uh, and I think what we'll see is in, later in the summer and in the fall, uh, some tabletop exercises, if you will, get together, uh, talk about what the priorities are of the traffic getting through, and the Coast Guard working with industry and working with our partners uh, in government as well will we'll sort of war game it, uh, to put it in Army terms, war game this event and see what needs to come through, what's constrained by tides, what industries are most uh, susceptible to shortages if there is a delay, things of that nature. Uh, and we're going, to, uh, we're going to make it work by working together with those partners. A uh, couple of other major concerns for us, especially as you see, uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a little red box in, inside of the yellow uh, box there, just north of the waterfront in the city. That is the typical safety zone flight box for Fleet Week, just as a point of comparison. Oftentimes uh, we hear people say, well, if America's Cup is going to be like uh, an oversized Fleet Week. Well, that would be an understatement. Uh, if you take a look at it, that box is much smaller, and it also is only a four-day period in, in October, whereas we're talking about multiple longer periods in the middle of the summer, which is, of course, high season for recreational boating and, and on-water activity. So we're working very closely with the event co coordinators and the America's Cup race managers, and everything we've heard to this point, both in terms of managing traffic uh, which certainly the races, if they take 45 minutes, that would, will give us uh, opportunities, windows to move uh, big vessels in and out. And, as, and also in terms of on-water enforcement. Everything we're hearing from the America's Cup organizers is positive to this point, and we don't see any reason why that won't continue to be the case. In fact, next month we have a couple of key meetings set up with America's Cup race organizers, uh, Coast Guard people, and probably we'll in invite some people from our Neptune Coalition which is a standing group in the Bay Area that has represent representatives from all sorts of law enforcement and public safety agencies that are stakeholders on the water. We're going to have a couple of key meetings, and we're actually going to really hash out, get out some charts and pencils and dividers, and start marking up the chart to see what is this, uh, or what are these various possible race courses going to look like, where are spectator areas going to be, and how are we going to start really, truly uh, facilitating commerce movement when we, when we have to uh, in those periods between the races. So uh, it is uh, a challenge ahead of us, no question about that. There are certainly more questions than answers right now, but I think everybody in the Coast Guard is pretty heartened by the positive attitude and the teamwork and the willingness to be flexible and work together that we've seen so far. Uh, if there's a, a byword, a watchword for the Coast Guard, as we look forward to America's Cup, it's relationships. And uh, we are very fortunate to have outstanding relationships with all the key uh, maritime stakeholders in the area, both uh, in industry as well as our, our government partners, federal, state, and local. And since we're not meeting any of those people for the first time, we're able to build on those relationships and uh, tackle this uh, as we go ahead. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. And uh, are you going to play the role of spoiler, Mr. Travis? Uh, okay, you hope so. Uh, I think everyone knows Will Travis, and I hope all of you know that my lighthearted, lighthearted banter with him is, is just that. I have the utmost respect for a very brainy individual, a great community leader, longtime director of the uh, San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission and my good friend Will Travis. And I think I heard him snicker as he was looking at Gary's timeline at the red one, the permitting line. Thank you, John. Trav? Um, I told you earlier about how BCDC views our permittees as partners once we issue the permit. Uh, we've issued a lot of permits to the Port of San Francisco, so we view them as a partner. I don't think Monique Moyer would necessarily want me here representing the Port of San Francisco, even though we're great partners. 
Uh, so I want to make it clear, I'm not representing the port. I want to tell you a little bit about our experience with the America's Cup. When we first heard about San Francisco putting in a bid for the America's Cup, we're very proud of what we've done at BCDC in terms of protecting the bay. So here was an event that was going to draw a lot of people to the waterfront to enjoy all that public access that we required of a lot of you and would expose our handicraft for the past half century of protecting the bay to a worldwide audience and remember that half of our name is development and bring in billions of dollars to the local economy. Now we looked at that and said, hey, that sounds pretty cool. So what our staff did was prepare a resolution of endorsement for the America's Cup bid to take to our commission. Now this is an event that's going to require permits from BCDC. So it's like saying having the commission in essence endorse a project that needs a permit from it that hasn't gone through the process of being reviewed yet. Well, what did the commission do? They unanimously adopted this. They've never done anything like this in 46 years. Now, probably because of our success with this, the mayor's office in San Francisco thought, well, these guys know the environmental community. And probably because of our success with it, the environmentalists said, well, these guys know the mayor's office. So there was this proposal because of the CEQA process, well, let's just exempt this from CEQA. And the environmentalists were calling me and they were saying, why do they want a CEQA exemption? What do they want to do? And I was talking to the mayor's office and said, what do you want a CEQA exemption? What do you want to do? And the answer is, well, we don't know what they want to do because they haven't decided what they want to do, but we know that we can't possibly do it within the context of CEQA, so we need an exemption. And it, it was going like this. And then I quickly realized something. Every time an environmentalist called me, they always started the conversation with, I really want the America's Cup to come to San Francisco Bay. So I shared this with the mayor's office, and they were in negotiations, and they were trying to go to Ellison and get the bid and deliver a CEQA exemption to show that we could do it here in the Bay Area. And they weren't going to get that. But what they wisely did was realized that the environmental community really wanted the America's Cup to happen. So instead they announced, with great fanfare, that they'd reached a grand accord with the environmental community in the Bay Area and they all wanted the America's Cup and we all agreed to work together and to make it happen. So it was a success they delivered rather than a failure. So this is now pr moving through the process. And the challenge for all of us that are dealing with this is that as you've heard, the, the America's Cup is a wonderful grand temporary event that'll come to the Bay, do more grand things, then go away. But as part of the agreement, the Ellison people have development rights along the waterfront. And some of the things they want to do, and you've heard about the cruise ship terminal, what they want to do is build a cruise ship terminal, put up a coal shell, use that for the America's Cup event, and then leave, and then later on they'll come finish it off for a cruise ship terminal. Well, there's only one thing wrong with that. The plan for the San Francisco waterfront has the cruise ship terminal down on Pier 3032. And where they want to put it, the plan says, no, you can't have it there. And besides that, the plan obligates them to tear off part of Pier 23, which is a historic shed that the historic community wants to keep, so they want to change all of that. And similarly, there's a proposal to put in some spectator boating. These are these mega yachts in areas along the waterfront which are reserved in the plans for open water basins for the public. Well, we looked at that and said, you know, putting temporary berthing in there for these mega yachts, it's kind of like a public park where you want to close it for a weekend or a week and you have a, a fair or a festival and then you take the tents down and then it's a public park again. So we said, well, that probably can be okayed. It's not going to be controversial, it's just temporary. But in order to accommodate the yachts, they need to do dredging. And under the agreement between the Ellison people, and by the way, the Ellison people didn't get rich by not being really tough. 
uh, the agreement says that if they do investment in dredging, they have then a right to put a marina in there subject to getting the requirements fulfilled from all the other agencies, which is like us. And if they can't get that permit, then the Port of San Francisco is obligated to pay the Ellison people the money back for the dredging. So we looked at that and said, well, wait a minute. This is like putting in lots of permanent infrastructure for the temporary festival in the park, infrastructure that is only needed and makes sense to spend the money on if you've already decided to close the park and use it for something else. And that decision should be made in an open, transparent process, which is going to take a lot longer than the little short time that Gary gave us on his, on his flow chart to do the permitting. So pulling these things apart and really doing the permitting for the America's Cup and then leaving behind all the environmental analysis, but then making the thoughtful decisions later on. Yes, yes, there will be a cruise ship terminal there. Uh, yes, you can leave a pier there. Yes, you can change this area from an open water basin to a marina. All those steps would take place later. And the America's Cup people naturally don't want to make some of these investments unless they have the certainty that will only come about later. So as you've heard from many other people up here, this is a challenge, but it is one that we are all confident that we can achieve. I think the important thing to realize in all this is there is no plan B. We either do this or we do this. Thank you. Thanks, Trav. And uh, now I'd like to open it up to questions. Do we have any? Yes, Paul Shepard. How many, how many people do you expect to come to the Bay Area for the 2013 event? And, well, whatever the other one was, it's slipped away. The, um, just on. the hours of viewing uh, raises an interesting question. Um, when we were negotiating for the cup, I had a, uh, a friend introduce me by phone to someone who worked for ESPN, and he told me that uh, they had told Ellison that San Francisco was the only place they'd televise it because it had a predictable win, so you, when you say it's gonna race at X time, it will race at X time, and then you have iconic background and you have, uh, more importantly, the right time zone for the East Coast to watch it. So uh, the winds start around 11. I think the races will probably start in the early afternoon. And because of the speed of these boats, it's going to take less than an hour where it used to take two to three hours for a race. And I, I, I want to add one other thought because when I heard Will talk about the environmental issues, because of that smart decision not to seek the exemption, all the environmental groups signed on to the deal. Because they signed on to the deal, both at the Port Commission and at the Board of Supervisors, there was not one person who testified against the resolution and, and the agreement that we put together. This had a consequence. The mayor told me he had to hold the phone out as far as he could get it because Ellison called him up and gave him 15 minutes of profanity saying, I must have got screwed if the Board of Supervisors voted 11 nothing for this thing. <laughs> they can't vote 11 nothing to adjourn. <laughs> I would say they're, they're estimating, this is guesswork because it's never been viewed before, but 250,000 to 300,000 on a given peak day. So. I have, <coughs> have a question for the commander. What's, and uh, pardon me if I'm not reading this correctly, what steps have been taken to comply with the Jones Act cabotage laws, that expression doesn't mean anything to me, I I'm, apologize, particularly as it applies to the large spectator vessels of foreign registry or other vessels of foreign registry not part of the race teams. Does that? Yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, well, 
I'm not a lawyer, and I didn't play one on TV, so. <laughs> this is something that we've actually been working very closely with uh, America's Cup organizing officials and our legal staff, and really this is more of a customs and border protection issue than it is directly a Coast Guard issue. But as I understand it, we should expunge the idea that this has any impact on the Jones Act uh, from our consciousness. This is about a different cabotage law, uh, not the Jones Act, uh, called the Passenger Vessel Act. And uh, we've been, as I said, working very closely with some of the folks that are running the, uh, the super yacht program for America's Cup. And they have met with uh, local labor leaders and assured them that this is not the kind of uh, activity that's going to take business from uh, local uh, vessels and, uh, and local businesses. Uh, so to make a long story short, this isn't the Jones Act you were looking for. This is, this is entirely a different, uh, a different uh, law altogether. <coughs> Uh, I, I just agree with that. We've been in those conversations as well uh, with, with, uh, with labor, with uh, folks in D.C. Um, I think we're, we're trying to get a good picture of uh, the votes that are coming and, and what the, the sort of issues they raise on this and a number of different levels in terms of not only the legal issues but where they're going to be, how they're going to be managed. So, um, you know, I think we're working towards generating that understanding sort of on, on the front end so that we can manage this going forward. Right. These are not the kind of vessels that would be selling tickets on the pier side. These are chartered super yachts. So it, it's uh, under a different uh, set of cabotage laws altogether. Exactly. Well, thanks. Uh, a related question. Uh, <clears throat> if a baseball hit out of <laughs> the giant stadium, whatever it's called today, AT&T Park, uh, hits a crew member on the head. Is that decided under admiralty jurisdiction or no? <laughs> no. What what coordination? That's the question was serious. Uh, pardon me. The question is: Is there any effort to coordinate with the, the Giants and the scheduling of baseball games at AT&T Park and with the race? Mike. Well, I know that uh, uh, Pier 50 was once considered an integral part of the plan. In fact, that was the pier that we eliminated and caused the glitch where they went to Rhode Island. And part of that consideration was its proximity to the Giants and the activities that they have planned for that site. But I don't think there's going to be any conflict with games because the location of the stadium is really at the other end of the waterfront to uh, where the start line is and all the viewing corridor for the America's Cup. Um, so it's, it'll, it'll, uh, it, there hasn't been any coordination of schedules yet. OK. <clears throat> now, here. Here's a very plain question, plainly uh, directed to Mr. Buell. So how did we win it? What tipped the scales in favor of San Francisco against those Italian cities, Newport, Rhode Island, and all the rest? What, was there any one factor that tipped it at the end? That's a very interesting question, because as I related when, when we held that dinner to show the unanimous support, something really changed in the negotiations and it's my personal opinion and purely my personal opinion that neither Spain nor Italy given the international economic factors were really in a position this time to offer that kind of money and I think they would have been chastised for doing it and uh, I think that started to become clear the second thing I would say is what I mentioned about uh, television that uh, this, the other races would be offshore. This, this arena, is, is they'll get much more viewership. And I think with Ellison wanting to totally revitalize the America's Cup and transform it with what's often been said, kind of moving it to a Formula One race with high technology and, and a lot of action, uh, I think the Bay became the apparent place where they could generate the revenues with television. Thanks. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. And then Jim. <laughs> I'm Brian Beveridge. I'm uh, from, with the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. And uh, we do a variety of things relative to environment. But we're, into, we're working with uh, young people. We have a summer science program. Um, have always been interested in, we work on air quality issues right now, because that's very pertinent to our community. Uh, we're interested in getting kids closer to the bay, which some of the kids in our neighborhood of West Oakland have almost never seen the bay, right? 
uh, even though it's about a half mile away. Also interested in the um, economic opportunity that, that is presented by this big event and wondering if there is already uh, planning in place or is there a, uh, an, uh, an access point that people like us should be using to get kids involved, to find out more about the youth sailing pieces, to find out more about the job opportunity pieces, because the, the timetable is long enough that we could begin some, some job training, some skills development stuff to get people ready to work on this project. So Maybe I can give a little bit. The America's Cup Organizing Committee has about 50 members. Among them are people like Sophie Maxwell, a former supervisor from the Hunters Point area in San Francisco, and David Lewis has saved the bay, and they come to mind because they're co-chairing a, a, a committee. One, uh, we're, we're trying, to, uh, I'm sorry, they're both chairing different committees. One is chairing an environmental committee, and one is chairing a neighborhood outreach committee. And in the neighborhood outreach, in, in specifically looking at sailing, uh, one of the barriers to kids sailing, particularly from disadvantaged communities, is that they first have to learn to swim. So they're already putting programs together, working with the Recreation and Park Department to, to start to initiate that. In addition, the Event Authority wants to have a whole clinic around sailing and, and operate it. So I think you'll find, uh, if you go to the, the website for the America's Cup, you'll start to see mention of both these aspects. And uh, the job opportunities, again, they have on their site if, if people are interested in, in what jobs they know about. but. We're, we're literally only four months into this, and so much has been done, and we're behind on everything. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's just that the nature of the beast. Jim McGrath. Uh, there's, this, this is done. There are hundreds of yacht races on San Francisco Bay every year. There's a great relationship between the Coast Guard and the race organizers. Uh, the America's Yacht Club has been smart enough to hire, uh, I'll leave uh, John's name off the table, away the, the man who runs most of the races um, and there's the Fleet Week. So there's a John there, Craig. John Craig. So there's a, a professional body of people that do this and make the coordination and it's including the Fleet Week operation. It's very scalable and, and you know they're using the best. Thank you, Jim. And uh, here is a question. Oh I think I know what the answer is. Trav, what is the number one lesson learned for any project in the Bay based upon the America's Cup experience? Answer, call your project the America's Cup and you have this resolution already approving it. <laughs> what, is, what would, Gary, you have been toiling in the, in, in the waters of doing environmental review, complicated, not so complicated, major permitting of major projects. What do you think is the number one lesson learned so far for any other project based on this experience? Well, I uh, wish we were a little further along to draw, to draw a clear uh, lesson at this point, but, uh, but I would say, um, you know, collaboration with commitment mm -hmm. is, is uh, collaboration is one thing, um, but we need, but, but um, what I see now is that we have developed a, a sort of shared commitment from all of the parties that have been meeting. And we've had meetings out the yin yang here on this and, and still, and, 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 and uh, now that we've kind of got a rhythm going, I, I think it's, it's clear that everyone is committed mm -hmm. to a solutions oriented kind of approach to this. And to me, that's the lesson learned so far. <laughs> well, we got to bring this to a close unless we have one last question. Yes, you, you did have a question. A, a question or a comment? <laughs> well, it's, a, it's great to hear all this beautiful planning. I think it's uh, a wonderful idea to bring it t to the Bay Area. But I, I look at this as not just San Francisco. I look at it as a regional collaboration. So I would like to see us do more outreach to the region and how we can participate with you. Um, one, one thing that I did not hear you talk about the collaboration is the airport. Uh, you're going to have a lot of helicopters up in the sky during this time. And how are you working with the towers and controlling some of the 
private and uh, television helicopters and all the noise they're going to bring with them. Um, again, you know, I think this is a great opportunity and hope that you will reach out to the youth. Uh, my father had a, a flight school at Oakland Airport for 35 years, and youth was one of the things that we continued to, we continued at that time, my father has passed on, but um, bringing the youth into yachting as well as um, aviation, it was one of his, um, passion and my both of my brothers are into it so I'm really grateful that you're bringing this to the Bay Area thank you thank you thank you very much and it sounds as though the rec and park uh, department is is bringing it to the youth uh, as, as Mark mentioned but as to your question about coordination with SFO helicopters Mike sure so we are uh, in contact with the Federal Aviation Administration uh, as well as Caltrans who uh, regulates the helicopter traffic at the lower elevation uh, lower uh, elevations um, and uh, you know that's an ongoing planning process I think you're exactly right to know that that's it's not only a safety issue it's an environmental issue is trying to figure out how to keep the airspace clear but also much like with uh, the, the shipping traffic keeping the economic engine and the, and the travel engine moving in the Bay Area so again it's it's early in the process but we're really working to coordinate that along with all the other pieces as well all right thank you very much that concludes the panel on the America's Cup, and John, are you coming up, or is Mr.